Uh, my name is Tomasz Piałucha. I'm a director of research and development at Guided Ultrasonics in London. And uh, I would like to talk today about uh, machine learning assisted advanced data interpretation for the quantitative short range uh, corrosion under pipe support remaining wall uh, measurements. I guess this is uh, a topic which has been uh, you know, uh, going uh, on for, for, for many, many years. And there is a very good reason why we want to uh, carry on with the research and uh, development uh, in this field. Um, uh, before I go even further, I would like to just uh, <clears throat> Uh, show what I'm going to talk about, which is going to be an introduction. Then we're going to talk about challenges uh, uh, concerning, you know, corrosion and the pipe supports in general. Then we are going to talk about methodology, which uh, we adopted at GUL to look into this particular problem. Then we are going to show the uh, the device which we built in order to to uh, to actually tackle the problem. And then, of course, uh, once you buy the device, then you see more problems. And then we came ac you know, across something which I think would, would, would be very useful to employ, employ, employ machine learning. And, uh, and cloud computing is, of course, an essential tool for actually data storage and signal processing uh, if you want to have an access worldwide to the to the algorithms, I believe. And then we are going to show you a few examples and the summary and then questions and answers. So as an introduction, I would say that uh, the guided wave short range scanning is a relatively brand new guided wave technique which we patented worldwide over the last uh, three years. And um, we believe that this is the only quantitative inspection solution for the challenges presented by the corrosion and the pipe supports. Um, and um, it is a relatively low frequency method, which is uh, very useful to know because I believe that any acoustic method has to deal with attenuation and scattering in the real world, scattering and attenuation of waves. And this one, I believe, is the lowest frequency method, method which employs the lowest frequencies that contains the thickness information about the pipe. And therefore, we can you know, measure the minimum wall thicknesses at the point of corrosion. And this method will be the least affected by the attenuation and scattering. I believe that there is a wide scope for expansion of this method, especially with the use of uh, current machine learning techniques. Uh, which we are going to discuss uh, a little bit further. And uh, I believe that machine learning algorithms significantly increase the accuracy, uh, reliability and sizing of these defects, which I believe is excellent news for both NDT practitioners as well as end users, because they are going to end up with much better quality of inspection, much more reliable uh, inspection technology. So what are the challenges when it comes to uh, corrosion and the uh, pipe supports? Yes, I mean, if you look at uh, the expansion of petrochemical industry in the 20th century, all this, uh, you know, business really started in the second half of the 20th century in the late 50s and the massive expansion of hardware, you know, and the, the building of all the uh, you know, necessary plants to, you know, to uh, 
process, uh, you know, petrol, uh, pet um, petrol in general, they all started around uh, in the uh, late early, early 70s and 80s. That was a 20 years period when huge amount of hardware was built all over the world. And now, 50 plus years later, we are all using in majority of this hardware today. So, as you can see, the things which were not really important in the 60s, 70s, today there's becoming a problem. And one of them is the physical integrity of all these old, old aging hardware. And one of the key problems, I believe, is the contact points between the pipe and the pipe support. This is where you know, this is where uh, we want to, you know, to focus our attention on. Well, if we look at the pipes in general, uh, I've been to I mean, too many plants and uh, you will see this, um, you know, um, about hundreds of kilometers of pipelines. All of them, they have the same pattern of uh, support lines where all these pipelines are laid upon, resting upon, and they are more or less seven meters, you know, uh, apart. So if you think about one, say, uh, one kilometer long pipe line, then you will end up with 150 supports supporting this pipeline. Then every seven meters you have this support and if you think about a generic kind of pipe which you will see there there will be about approximately 10 inch schedule 40 pipe which is about 9.3 millimeter wall thickness this pipe will weigh approximately 60 kilometers per length one meter length so each of the support will actually take on approximately half a ton of metal. And this metal is going to be basically in intimate contact with the support for many, many, many years. The pipe is going to move around, expand, shrink and all the rest of it. So after many, many years, there will be a problem associated with corrosion in this particular points. The problem with the challenge, major challenge of the inspection of these points, they are very difficult to access because they are being pressed by this pipe and basically sealed by the weight of this pipe. So let's have a look at the, at the picture which I took, I don't know, five years ago at one of the point, at one of these uh, you know, refineries here in UK where you can see where there is some uh, point of contact here. Let's imagine that you have a half a ton of weight resting upon this I-beam. Then you have this corrosion uh, you know, product, which is more or less flaky, kind of like a you know, uh, French pastry type of metal, kind of French pastry, which is pressed in the hub by many hundreds of kilograms of weight. Now, nobody really can tell how much of this pipe has been eaten by this corrosion after 50 years of service, unless you remove this support, clean this, pro, you know, this part of pipe, and then you do direct measurement using profiler of some description, either it's going optical or mechanical, whatever. So as you can see, the access of the, to this area will require pipe lifting, you know, and, uh, and all the pipes definitely will be obscured by multiple paint layers. Maybe paint layers will be even spilling over from the pipe on the support, making the whole thing very difficult to actually to access. Uh, and, and nevertheless, you know, 
not even thinking about um, uh, measurement, uh, quantitative measurement or not. So, uh, we at Guided Ultrasonics, we decided to, you know, to uh, try uh, guided wave methods where you will have one at one point around the circumference of the pipe, a transmitter, position transmitter, as you can see here, ST on the left hand side, like the 10 o'clock position, more or less. And then you have the receiver on the equivalent sym symmetrical position, some, something like two o'clock position on the right hand side. Then the transmitter will generate shear horizontal waves which are going to travel clockwise over the top of the of the pipe and get picked up by the receiver also the transmitter at the same time will generate the shear wave guided shear wave which is going to travel counterclockwise which is which is this red arrow anti-clockwise and is going picked up by the same receiver coming basically uh, from so these two waves are going to be coming from different directions one is going to road travel clockwise the other one anti-clockwise so the idea is that by sending these waves which are going to travel around the circumference of the pipe from the remote position we are going to be able to measure the minimum wall thickness at the point somewhere at the point of six o'clock which uh, you know at the first look at the, of this it looks pretty uh, challenging you know uh, task to do or maybe just too challenging and we'll see how this is all been solved so some of the wave modes here which we are going to show you. Some of the wave we are going to send along the circumfer pipe circumference. Some of these waves, shear horizontal waves, guided waves, are not sensitive really to the variation of wall thickness. And some of them, they are sensitive to the variation of wall thickness. And variation of wall thickness is what we are really after because changes in the wall thickness created by corrosion process is essentially this is what we really are want to measure so let's have a look what we can achieve with that so we are having here um, a finite element uh, uh, and the simulation of a section of the pipe when the waves are getting generated by the transmitter which is uh, shown here in red in red uh, 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 square and then receiver is this uh, is uh, shown here in blue and as you can see this um, transmitter is basically sending these two waves, the wave uh, patterns, you know, two wave pulses fr from, from the point of origin, which is the transmitter, position transmitter, clockwise and anti-clockwise. As you can see, this one goes around at the top of the pipe and this one goes at the bottom of the pipe and so on. They are going to travel along all the time and, you know, infinitely, as long as it's you know there's no dissipation of uh, of energy this is going to go go and on and on and on this kind of pattern very simple pattern takes place only when we are able to generate the the most basic um guided wave shear horizontal guided wave sh0 mode 0 and to give you an idea uh, for an eight millimeter wall thickness, this has to be below 200 kilohertz to generate only SH0 wave. So if you basically uh, generate this type of uh, excitation 
on the on the on the pipe you will only see sh0 propagating circumferentially along the pipe uh, uh, around the pipe however when you start raising the frequencies for example from two from 170 or 200 kilohertz to say 300 kilohertz 350 kilohertz then things are going to change because what we are going to see is not only this SH0 gets generated, but also SH1. This is a first order mode. As you can see, it's a bit sluggish. It stays behind the SH1 and it spreads its energy as it travels. So this one is very nice and sharp. The other one follows it a bit behind and looks like a fish basically, you know, swimming in the ocean and it gets stretched all the time as, as it goes. Okay. And this is very interesting pattern, you know, which we will see when, it, when you raise frequencies above 200 kilohertz for eight millimeter ball thickness and higher and higher, then we'll see more and more of these waves being generated. Uh, and um, I believe this is quite interesting to see. Well, now what we are going to see is that if we look at the very low frequency components of these uh, waves, which is the first or zero order mode SH1, <clears throat> and we will simulate a defect or basically or cut a defect or come across a defect in reality, then as you can see this H, H uh, uh, here, shear horizontal zero uh, order mode is absolutely immune to the presence of defect because these modes are insensitive to the variation of wall thickness. So these the, these uh, modes they are simply uh, just travel with regardless whether you have a massive uh, or smaller variation of no variation of wall thickness along the pipe they are traveling without any problems whatsoever and there is no any interaction between them. They are just simply, they don't really notice the, the, the existence of the defect. However, when it comes to the higher order modes, these dispersive modes, they are very sensitive to wall thickness variations. As you can see here, now, at the higher frequencies, what we are going to see is that SH0 is being followed by this fish looking like SH1. And look what happens now. Part of it gets reflected, part of it gets transmitted, as you can see very clearly. You know, and this is what we want to analyze, and this is what we want to quantitatively process and extract information about the defect. So the simple pulses, which are easy to analyze, they give us almost no information about the wall thicknesses. But those animals, which are difficult to capture, or difficult to inter you know, in interact with, difficult to process. These are little, these animals, this is what we want to talk to. This is the, they own the information, they react to the defects. And these are the modes which we want to study and learn from the interaction between these dispersive modes and the defects, right? So, if we look at the time representation, frequency times uh, simple representation of this dispersive and non-dispersive mode. Let's assume that we have an oscilloscope, we connect this to the receiver and then we will see the first pulse as, as it's coming here. This is the zero order mode. This one is insensitive to the variation of wall thickness. And then it follows like a, uh, like a, like a fish looking kind of feature and this is our dispersive mode, and this is what we want to analyze quantitatively and see what we can achieve by the analysis of this of these of these modes. 
what we could do, we could do so-called wavelet transformation. Uh, I designed a special wavelet for this uh, in order to you know, make it uh, as as good as possible in terms of signal to noise ratio and other and, and other important parameters. And then what we will see here is the frequency versus time. So as you can see, non-dispersive um, node, which is the first one here, is represented by containing all the frequencies, you know, between this range here in relatively short uh, uh, time period, period of time very short period of time. All of these frequencies are being contained in the same signal. However, in dispersive mode like this, the, the frequency components are spread, as you can see in the kind of uh, comet-like shape, where the higher frequency components come first because they are the fastest, and the lower com frequency components drag behind the guy slower and slower and slower and then in the asymptote they will be just going to infinity because this tail actually is become is actually stays in the point of departure because it's essentially the source the birth place for this mode is the first through thickness resonant frequency of the pipe wall and that's why it's just getting stretched from this from this resonant point into infinity and that's why this wave essentially is infinitely is will in you know will just drags like if it was made of chewing gum basically from the point of departure which is the transmitter this is non dispersive sh0 this one is dispersive sh1 this one is dispersive sh1 this is the special. So these are the two equivalent representations of the same of the same of the same uh, signal, and we will ask ourselves why are we actually looking into it? Well, what is this for, and why we want to have a look at this thing? Okay, there's a very good reason for that. Because if we look at a very simple uh, case when there is a plate and you have a transmitter here on the left hand side and the receiver on the right hand side, then the receiver will pick up the zero order mode as we can see it here, we wave the transformation and the SH1 as a dispersive one will follow the, the SH0 as you can see here. Then if we have a loss wall loss somewhere in the middle between transmit and receiver then suddenly what we will see is that of course the zero order mode is exactly the same as before but the first order mode as you can see is getting cut off at a at some specific frequency so only the head of the fish or the head of the yeah of this uh, uh, comet passes through from transmitter to receiver while the tail of it is getting reflected and then if we have a circumferential you know if, if this plate is circumferential you know the loop then it will come from the other direction this reflected tail back to the receiver but from the other direction and by studying the frequency at which this cutoff takes place. Hello. Um, I, somebody is interfering with my presentation. Sorry, I'm just looking to see if I can find who's not. Uh, maybe, please, uh, can somebody switch the microphone off? Okay, so then basically this tail is getting reflected. The head of the of this comet uh, passes through, and this this distinctive cutoff frequency when the whole process of reflection transmission takes place is related to the minimum wall thickness. And this is the beauty of the whole thing, because all you need to do is just to look at which 
at which part, at which frequency the split takes place, and then you got the minimum wall thickness between transmitter and receiver measured quantitatively, and this is what we are after really, and this is the beauty of the whole thing. So, having seen what the underlying fundamental uh, the feature is, then we can build a device which uh, is shown schematically on this picture here. So we have some kind of a computer which is uh, which is the center place part of it. Then you have a frame which basically keeps the computer, you know, an electronic pad. Uh, uh, keeps together with the transmitter, which is here, and the receiver, which is on the on here. This is the motorized scanner when mo the motor will be mo moving incrementally this device along the pipe and just provide the whole profile of this of the defect as long as as it goes along the as it goes along the pipe. So first of all, this the, this device can easily easily measure pipe diameter. Basically, you can use SH zero because it's independent. It's independent of the wall thickness. So the circumferential, you know, time of flight will just give you a very good measurement of pipe diameter. Then you have a top path wall thickness because the uh, you can measure the wall thickness between transmitter and receiver top path wall thickness, bottom path wall thickness, because sometimes top path is not exactly the same as the wall bottom path, usually usually because it's some um, um, eccentricity in pipes, and which is we can, we can measure very accurately these eccentricities to within a fraction of the millimeter. It's no problem whatsoever using this method. And then of course the major, major thing which we are after is the bottom path minimum wall thickness. This is the minimum wall thickness, which minimal um, wall thickness after the corrosion has eaten some of the of the of the wall. So this is the remaining metal basically, which we can measure using this method. So on the left hand side, you, uh, I took a picture on one stage uh, when I was doing some experimentation somewhere in UK of this. Uh, of Tom, this Tom yes. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, yeah? I don't mean to interrupt, but I think you probably need to spin on it quickly to get to the machine learning stuff before you're out of time. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, okay, cool. No problem. So quantitative short range. You know, this is the this is the uh, this is the device which is reliable and easy to use, it scans the uh, pipe along top and its own power, does not require any Kaplan because it's uh, it's uh, it's essentially generates them using the the EMAT uh, transduction, which is very useful uh, for the scanner like this. The, the software automatically configures the scan parameters and uh, uh, Simple, there is a simple display of the measured minimum remaining wall thickness at each scan point and all the rest of it. So this is what you would expect from the, you know, well put together, uh, you know, uh, old school, uh, you know, uh, device like this. Um, and then what we are going to see here, you know, we can compare two results. The one of them here is the is the pipe which doesn't have any defect the, and the bottom one which has a defect. As you can see transmitted SH1 here mode is very present. Here there is no, there is no transmission of this mode whatsoever. There's a big reflection of this mode coming through here. And then you, by looking at the cutoff frequency, we can easily measure the, uh, the remaining wall thickness at this path and uh, and uh, this is what we will see. The scan direction is from the left to right. We go through indexing centimeter by centimeter along the pipeline, and then we're just going to see the profile of the of this of this of the of the defect. As you can see, the defect here though is approximately 
gives about four millimeter for remaining wall thickness out of eight, which is approximately 50% of its wall thickness has been eaten by the corrosion. And these are the these are the results which we would like to have because they are quantitative and you can be useful for the operators and people who are actually after the maintaining the integrity of the of the of this pipe. Okay, there are many problems associated with analysis of this kind of uh, of the spectrograms because there are a lot of features which humans cannot really easily detect, detect as well as uh, um, here you have a pretty good examples, but the, some of them they have a lot of uh, attenuation built into it, scattering and all sorts of things and it's very easy for human to actually make a mistake or not to be quite sure. It's a lot of data to be analyzed. It takes time. It's very tedious. It is. We want to have some kind of automation, you know, around this to put it into a completely different level. So that's why we ended up with machine learning and the machine learning algorithms in general. And we have experienced that ourselves that offer fast, reliable, objective and human independent analysis of corrosion profiles. And the problem with the machine learning for this particular application is to get reliable, high quality data, quantitative data. And uh, we managed to have a combination of various, various data from various sources. And we approximately have 2 million of data points which we can use for machine learning uh, per, per, uh, purposes. And uh, methods, machine learning methods we are currently using is three which we found uh, useful, which is artificial neural networks, AMN so called, and then the generic algorithms, essentially evolutionary algorithms and then logistic regression uh, algorithms three of them we are using they are all you know they are they are actually get, get, giving us very similar very similar answers which is useful so we can be basically cross, cross checking our, our progress you basically by using different approaches to get to yield uh, the best uh, results for us um, machine learning data is obtained in three follow in three ways. Of course, one is the scanning and profiling of ex service pipes, and then we have a scanning and profiling of physical pipes with man made defects, imitating real defects. So, somebody is actually making these defects, you know, artificially mimicking the real ones, or you know, you know doing all sorts of things with the defects and basically subjecting. The, the the algorithms to all sorts, all sorts of uh, uh, torture and humiliation basically in order to yield good results. And then you have also a numerical simulation of the entire QSR scanning process using the latest finite element based methods. Uh, we have purchased our own special super microcomputer which is doing marvelous things actually. Amazing, amazing little machine. And the cloud computing comes to, into equation, of course, because once you, you have all this data to be processed somewhere in the pro properly sorted environment, then the then the life is is becoming so much easier. Uh, you know, it's unbelievable. So we can basically upload the data from the QSR into the cloud and then post process it. Uh, so that the client will have a data access analysis and final reports ready to be submitted to the to the um, to the to the end user. Uh, so we are going to show very quickly uh, how the machine learning works. This example. So we are going to scan the defect using our QSR uh, um, device. Then we laser scan the 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 the, the, uh, the defects and compare the results. So, for example, this one is a picture of a six inch pipe. The second picture here, the middle one, as you can see, is a map of the, of the, of the defects here. There's a big one here and the other one here. And then you have a laser scan which shows this kind of hump here. Uh, machine learning results are shown here. 
this one is uh, not very is you know, not not excellent yet because probably because of the scattering of these of these of the waves from from the defect and uh, this will be addressed at the later stage but uh, you know this is more or less what we will get using our method of course we have to realize the fact that uh, like uh, all remote techniques there is a resolution limit and also there is uh, uh, you know perfection sometimes is simply mm, not achievable but we can be close to perfection uh, by training these algorithms further and further we have this another uh, man-made defect digitally reconstructed uh, pitting corrosion you have the map here and this is basically what you will see from the laser scan objective reference profile and the machine learning results and then the third one machine learning we are going to see this kind of uh, sausage like shape with very nice pattern and sundown this one is relatively easy for this for this algorithm to gobble without any problems whatsoever it's very simple and some, you know easy for the machine to do that and then we'll just show you an example of the of the of something which is in in, in that industry this is 10 inch pipeline you have this supported this uh, uh, pipeline on i beam and this is a 40 centimeter scan from left to right. You can see the QSR was covered with uh, Perspex uh, kind of hat because it was raining. Uh, as you can see, you can see on the right hand side there's some corrosion, which is very difficult to see whether it's deep or shallow. And then what we are going to see here is the uh, the inspector uh, manual um, uh, assessment is a good quality guy who actually did it, uh, one of the best. And then you see the QSR machine learning uh, algorithm, which actually got it uh, very similar to that to the to what inspector has done, of course in a fraction of a second, and can do it days and nights, uh, three, 24 hours, seven days a week. So as you can see, this is what we have at the moment in terms of automation. In the summary, the machine learning algorithms improve the resolution of the corrosion profiling and using machine learning notably improves the speed and the reliability of analysis. There's no comparison, of course, because you know, computer, compute, computers are so much faster than humans in terms of number crunching. And we have done 250 physical samples, uh, you know, indust industrial kind of level. And uh, we showed that even in most difficult times, uh, the, the machine learning was within one millimeter to actually to the true profiles of better. And we are going to get better at that because the engines which we are using and we're training will further benefit from the continuous you know, expansion of our training database. And this is the questions. I'm really sorry for actually running so, 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 so late. I really, my apologies. Please, can I have the, can I have some questions, please? Hi there, Thomas. Um, you're still very much, you're st still in time and we have time for some questions. There's some, it's obviously a very important problem and I can see the advantage of the machine learning in terms of the complexity of the data. Um, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, if I just go back up through that. Yeah. A uh, question from Apostolus uh, from Mistras. Is this an update to the previous QSR calculation algorithm? I'm sorry, once again, is this not updated? Is, this, is this an update to the previous QSR calculation algorithm? Okay, the original algorithm which was uh, which I was the author uh, together. You know, we were just tweaking it together with Brian later. It was an old school approach. I mean, you are just lo look at laws of physics, you derive equations and you have some kind of de deterministic model basically of calculations. And then what we have discovered is that uh, in order to code all the inputs, you know, which we could possibly use, I mean, there will be no probably our timeline life will be too short to actually 
put if then else, if then then if if this in that and all the rest of it because there are so many parameters you can actually focus your attention. The machine learning algorithms actually use approximately 100 features from the scans and they make and they try to make sense out of them and uh, and uh, and the result of it is just far better than any uh, old school deterministic algorithm which we had before so yes it is a massive massive improvement in terms of reliability and quality of the data processing thank you hello you might be on mute. I was on um, mute, apologies. Um, question from Niall Dolly. When would the machine learning be part of the Wave Pro QRS software? QSR, uh, well, uh, uh, this software is ready at the moment. Uh, I believe that it will be definitely part of the offering uh, in month, you know, in a couple of months, I believe. You know, it's, it's, I think it's, I'm quite sure that it's it's um, it's a pretty solid piece of of uh, of, uh, of uh, signal processing uh, we have been through here, and I'm quite confident about the results of it. Uh, we have done recently. We have done some kind of a competition, really, like you know, like a early day stay, you know, early, early, early day chess competition between humans and machines, right? Uh, um, it's already winning basically with humans, you know, not all the time, but you know, if you if you plot the results, you can see that the skew is towards the machine learning and the time is on, 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 on our side, of course. So it's just a question of time when, when these algorithms will be so good that uh, the humans will only be you know, super, supervising them rather than actually doing hard work of hard weightlifting work of, uh, you know, uh, tedious uh, analysis of all this data. A um, couple more technical questions from Dave Perry. Um, do you still have a 50% maximum loss limit on sizing and does the frequency cutoff relate uh, to minimum well, detectable yeah. defects? Yeah, thank you for this. For, thank you for this uh, uh, question. Uh, we have expanded our limits now a little bit further because uh, we are not looking on the, on the cutoff frequencies, a combination of uh, some other important factors which can be uh, can be uh, used to our advantage uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I think that what we are doing we are training the algorithms for deeper defects I think that we are uh, we are at the moment at 60 percent of all loss. I don't know how far how far we can go but uh, we can reliably I think we using these algorithms can go to 60 percent okay great um, two more questions, um, technical. With machine learning, what is the minimum pipe diameter that could be scanned? And from Willie Hewson, and the minimum thickness of pipe that could be scanned? Yes, I mean, <clears throat> uh, well, if you have, uh, say, at the moment, what we have is about is, is six inch, six inch plus uh, wall diameter. Uh, the major difficulty for this uh, for this uh, uh, method uh, comes when you have a very low diameter pipe very small pipe and very thick uh, wall thickness because you can clearly generate all these modes but they are going to overlap to such an extent that you won't be able to tell uh, you know uh, what is what? So, uh, so uh, but because we have also very limited uh, access to what we can read, uh, we can only get get the information from the from the out, outside surfaces. So, from this point of view, you know, uh, we will probably have a limit uh, at six or maybe five inch diameter. And for this six inch diameter, if you have say 10 millimeter wall thickness, then it's becoming, becoming a, mass, a big puzzle, 
you know. But you know, you can have a small diameter as long as it's thin, thin wall. And of course, if you have a larger diameter, then you can have a thick wall. There's no problem whatsoever. There is basically the question of ratio between the wall thickness and the pipe diameter, which is the limiting factor. Okay, that's great. And the final question for the moment. Has Sorry, can I just add, Martin, do I just interrupt, just add to that quickly? Absolutely, um, yes. On the diameter, the, the axial tool that we're trialling at the moment reduces that minimum. We, we work out exactly how low we can go, but it does reduce the, the diameter that we can go down to. Yeah, yes, we have, a, we have another tool which is actually sending the wave axially, so along the pipe. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, the, the, the limit is just much further down, you know, further, much further down. Uh, for such a for such an arrangement of transmitter and receiver. Great, that's very useful um, to find out about those, those details. Um, final question for them from Joe Buckley: Has there been any formal comparison with other CARPS inspection approaches, uh, e.g., PA CAD? I assume that's that's the phase mm. array assisted tomography. Uh, um, well, can you repeat the question? Because I'm not quite sure what, what are... No what, uh, yeah. yeah, sorry, I, I apologise. Uh, I, I think I can answer that one, actually, Martin. Okay. I would say okay. there hasn't been okay. a strong independent comparison done yet with the phase array gap. I think there's been a few, but not what I would call thorough blind trials where you've got a high confidence in the results. Um, that's the sort of thing we're waiting for somebody to turn up at a hoist trial and do that comparison.